I thank you, Dwight Fire. Thank you, Luke. So today we're talking about the second half of the power of decision. Um, Reverend Mary courageously dived into it on a moment's notice last weekend because I, I was in there on Saturday and, and heading downhill with the, the particular cold that I had and, and finally went, I have no energy. You know, I can't, you know, this is not happening. And Reverend Sue and Reverend Pam were up at the retreat and, and I knew that Mary had this, uh, the, the showing with Paul's photographs, but I, I just called and said, um, can you handle it? And so she did. And so I appreciate that very much. <laughs> Although it hasn't been a year and a half, by the way, since you last spoke, because I know you did the Quimby manuscripts earlier this year and <laughs> a couple things, but anyway. The, the, the frustration that I have with, with Reverend Mary's talk last week, <laughs> see, whenever you're doing a two-part talk and you turn the first part over to somebody else, they steal your best material. And she did, you know. And there was this opening quote. It's the very first sentence in the book. And she, just like me, glommed onto it and said, that is a powerful opening. So, and it was, and it still is. And so I'm, I, I want to get to use it too. So we're going we're gonna to share this quote. Is that all right? All right. The individual's ability to act unintelligently in a universe of intelligence is amazing. <laughs> Seen the news lately? Unintelligent activity. Last week, uh, Reverend Mary talked about that one of the, th the things that Raymond Charles Barker talks about this week that really undermines our power of decision is the, is the quality of worry. And when we worry, we use our minds, our creative minds, our minds that, that take pictures and words and direct them into results. And we use them to focus on the things we don't want. And then therefore create more of those same results. I don't have enough money, so I'm going to worry about not enough money. I don't, you know, there, there's no good men, there's no good women, and so I keep on creating that. There's, you know, whatever it is that we worry about is what we keep on creating more of. Have you noticed? Okay? And that's the negative use of the creative power of our mind. We, we, the, the universe, the law of attention says the universe doesn't care what it produces. It just wants to know what am I putting my attention on. Michael Beckwith rephrases that and says, the universe doesn't care, it just wants to know what you're interested in, and it follows through on what you're interested in. And so if my primary interest is things not working out or things looking a certain way, the universe will tend to recreate that over and over and over and over again. Which brings us to the other main quality that he talks about in here that's a challenge, which was in the reading, and that is the quality of blame. I know you did. <laughs> blame. And so he says, don't blame the world. Don't blame the nation. Don't blame your family. Don't blame other people. Don't blame your own past self for your own mistakes. You know, some of us carry around a, a, a blaming of ourselves. I did something in the past that I'm so ashamed of or, or so, you know, I, I feel so bad about that I'm still going to carry that burden around and tear myself down because of it. Don't do that. Blame puts responsibility for my life and my happiness on someone else, and it totally disempowers me. As long as I've got the finger pointed out at somebody else being responsible for my happiness, I will never be happy. And I have no ability to make myself happy, because where's the power? It lies out there. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm still not completely healthy. But I'm working, well, I am completely healthy. That's the spiritual truth of me. And my body is catching up that image. I've made that decision. We fall into these patterns of worry and blame <laughs> because we place too much attention on the sensory world, the world of five senses out here. Mystics and, and, and spiritual teachers throughout history have told us that a fact is not a reality. How many of you have been absolutely certain of a fact only to find out that no, it really wasn't the fact? 
Okay? We've all done that. Okay? And so our senses and our minds play tricks on us. Even our memory plays tricks on us. You know, we, we have experiences where we're absolutely sure a same thing happened a certain way, and then we meet somebody else who was there at the same time and said, no, that's not my recollection whatsoever. Okay? And so even our memories play tricks on us. What he invites us to do instead is to go within and listen to the spirit within. You know, we have a powerful process called visioning, which is a way to bypass the intellectual mind and get to our intuition, which is our connection with the spirit within, and start to listen. What is it that really wants to come through me at this point in time? Which then frees me to make a decision based on that information rather than based on past experiences, past blame, past beliefs, past worries, and all that stuff. So we're being current with spirit. Raymond Charles Barker says, the repetition of that which is known is not progress. Or in other words, doing the same thing over and over and over and over again is not progress. New ideas are as essential for the mind as food and water are for the physical body. You cannot progress on the basis of the ideas that are now directing your thinking, feeling nature. Ooh. You cannot progress on the basis of the ideas that are now directing your thinking, feeling, nature. You know, the Course in Miracles says almost everything you think is wrong. <laughs> Boom! Right? <laughs> almost everything you think is wrong. Isn't that a great kind of wake-up call? It's a call for us to say, wait a minute, okay, if everything I'm thinking or almost everything I'm thinking is wrong, then what else is there? What else should I be paying attention to? And that's where he says we pay attention to that higher wisdom self that infinite presence within us. But our current way of doing things, our current way of thinking, keeps us in our current conditions. And if you want to change a situation, if you want to change a condition, you have to make a decision to do something new and to go somewhere different and hold a different image in the mind. So new ideas create life. New ideas come from listening to spirit within. New ideas are the decisions where we want to go rather than has, you know, re rehearsing and rehashing where we've been. He says, the decision to let go of that which has completed its course in your experience is even more important than the decision to welcome new ideas. You cannot walk forward by looking backward. You cannot walk forward by looking backward. So the decision to let go of that which has completed its course in your experience. How many of you know that you have something in your life that you're, you're done with, right? But you hang on to it because it's familiar and it's comfortable and you know how to work with it. But no progress happens. No forward motion, no forward movement happens because of that. And so what he's inviting us to do is Create new ideas. Tap into new ideas. You know, last week, Reverend Mary also tapped into a different book, and that was the book, A World That Works for All. And I'm going to tap into that same book because I love that book. We're, we're, as she mentioned last week, we're going to be spending the next year looking at this idea of a world that works for all, starting in January. And when I say we, I mean over 100 centers throughout the United States, religious science centers throughout the United States, are going to be engaged in a group spiritual practice, which is a very powerful thing when you get a whole bunch of people focused together on the same idea and working with the same process. <coughs> you create a very powerful vortex of energy that lifts people up and that causes stuff to happen. Excuse me. And so we decided to get together and focus on this idea of a world that works for all. Now, on one level, that sounds like pie in the sky, doesn't it? Yes? Yeah. <coughs> and somebody said over here, no, thank you. It sounds great. Okay? My eighth grade teacher once told me, she said, if, if you want to hit a wall, that's a you want to throw a rock and hit a wall that's a distance from you, she says, aim above the wall and you'll hit the wall. If you aim for the wall, you'll fall short. Okay? Even if we don't quite create a world that works for all, if we create a world that's just a plain old dang better place a year from now than it was today, that would be something great, wouldn't it? Okay? 
So that's what we're aiming at. <coughs> in this book, Sharif Abdullah talks about th that there are three archetypes we play with. <coughs> There's the keepers, the breakers, and the menders. And these archetypes live within all of us. They live within each of us. All three of them do, to some degree or another. And they show up everywhere. They don't just show up in the, the big world out there. They show up in our family lives. They show up in our homes. They show up in our workplace. They show up here in this center, right? And so one of the questions I asked the first service is, if we want to create a world that works for everyone, can we create a spiritual center that works for everyone? Can we take this little microcosm right here of relatively enlightened, relatively intelligent people and create a, a, a center that works for everyone? And so if we want to do that, we want to take a look at these archetypes and how they're playing out and how we can lift the consciousness of that whole process. And if this doesn't necessarily float your boat, you might want to take a look at it with your place of work. You might want to take a look at it with your family. You might want to take a look at it somewhere else in your life that really does float your boat and has, has high um, energy, that you have high energy about. So let's walk through this process. Let's look at these three archetypes and see what we can learn. So the first one is the keepers. The keepers tend to be the indigenous or original people in an area. <coughs> people who have been there since the beginning, whatever the beginning was. Okay? So if we look out around the world, we see uh, Native American culture here in, in the United States. We see um, similar culture down in South America. We see the aboriginal culture in Australia. Um, these are people who have been around for a long time. <coughs> and each of these groups holds a, both a mythology and a role. And so the mythology of the, of the indigenous people, the mythology of the keepers, is there was a past golden time. Okay? There was a past golden time. In, in the Australian aboriginals, it's the, uh, the dream time. Most Native American cultures have a time of great peace and, and you know, there was somewhere in the past. The Chinese, when you study ancient Chinese culture, have the time of the yellow emperor where everyone lived in peace and prosperity. There's always a time where there were wise elders. We all lived in peace and prosperity and happiness. This center has a golden time, right? Some of you are getting that, yes. And some of you are saying right now, and yes, you're absolutely right. The, the, the other part of the mythology is, but that golden time is gone, and now we are currently winding down to end times. In the, in the Hindu tradition, there's the dream of the Brahman, right? And we exist within the dream of the Brahman, which has four different parts of it, the last one being very chaotic, and finally the Brahman awakes and the dream ends. And 2,500 years ago, the Hindus were already saying, and we're in the last phase of that dream. Okay? People talk, I've got water already, thank you very much. But, um, thank you, Steve. But we have an end time, we have a winding down to the end time. It's slowly getting worse. But we're here to hang on to it as much as we can and carry it through. And then the other mythology is that there are sacred lands always associated with this. You know, sacred burial sites, sacred uh, places where, where certain things happen. You know, if you read the early, the Old Testament of the Bible, there's all these sacred places that are named because so-and-so did something famous here. Okay? And so we have this honoring of the sacred lands. The role of the keepers is to hold on to the past wisdom. They're the wisdom keepers of the past. The positive aspect of them is that they connect us with our roots. They connect us with our deep roots. The negative aspect of this role is that it gets stuck in the past, it doesn't move forward, and it doesn't see past old ways or old rules. Margaret Mead, who is an anthropologist, talks about working with a, a, an indigenous tribe in, in Australia, Aboriginal tribe, and they eventually took her out and showed her where the end of the world was. And it was a place out in the middle of the desert area. And they just said, it's that line right there. Now, she didn't see a line, but they saw a line. So she said, well, what would happen if I crossed that line? And they, they said, you'll never be seen again. You'll never come back again. So she, being the next thing that we're going to talk about, a breaker in that consciousness in that moment, said, let me step across that line. 
And so she walked across the line, and immediately the people started grieving for her death. And she's sitting there going, no, look, see, I'm right here. Can't you see me? They literally could not see her. Okay? Because they're, in their culture, that was it. That was the end of the world. Now, of course, she walked back in, and all of a sudden they're, oh, my God, nobody's ever done this before. Nobody's ever come back from having passed over to the other side. And so an indigenous, a, a, culture, uh, a culture of keepers, has this old ways that, it's, that it has to have, that this is the way it is done. Next comes the breakers. And the breakers are those who are here to break up the old ways. Who are here to break up the stuckness from that process. Okay? And so they're always new people. So when the Europeans came over to the United States of America, they were new people to this culture, to this continent, and they broke up the ways of the old indigenous tribes. Right? <coughs> What's that? Big time. And we've seen that over and over. When, when Christianity came into Europe, it broke up the ways of the pagans. And all those wonderful earth pagan traditions that are now beginning to resurface again were broken up. The Christians themselves had a whole breakup when the scientific revolution came along and said, you know what, um, the way that you think the universe works, uh, it, it doesn't at all. Okay? And so that's a breakup of a culture. We look at Islam, and Islam sees the West as trying to break up their culture. And so they return the favor by being breakers in our culture. And we do the dance back and forth. Take a breath. And we'll talk about this in a minute. The new people are always bright, shiny, new. They bring bright, shiny, new things with them. There's something attractive. The mythology is the old ways don't work, and the new ways are better. And the tendency with that is throw out everything of the old ways. Okay? And they're working towards a bright new future, but it tends to be my idea of what that bright new future is. It's a fairly narrow focus. Okay? So, when the Europeans came to the United States of America and created Manifest Destiny, and we get to you know, march across the land and take possession of it, it did not include the Native American vision of the future, did it? At all. Okay? And so breakers tend to, not always, but tend to work towards a bright future that's a narrow future that benefits them. Their role is to shake things up. They are evolutionary in their process. Okay? And of course they clash with the keepers because they're doing something different than the keepers, right? So the positive of this archetype is that it brings change and forward movement. And without change and forward movement, we don't grow and evolve as a species. And we have to grow and evolve. You know, Ernest Holmes tells us evolution is ever forward. It's the nature of the universe to express more and more and more of what it is. And so we have to have breakers. We have to have that breakup. The negative is violence. We're seeing that right now. Violence, sometimes physical, sometimes in words or emotions or interchanges. There's a my way attitude. The breakers can lose touch with their deep roots, their own deep roots in cultural wisdom, and they can have a tendency towards greed, taking advantage of the, the indigenous peoples that they're replacing and go for my future. Okay? And so as we can see, the breakers and the keepers tend to, by nature, be in conflict with each other, right? Okay? And if you look at what's happening in the world today, that's a picture of what is happening. We have people who are wanting to ground things, who are wanting to keep things as they were. I read a piece recently that said that the, the um, goal of ISIS or ISIL is to bring about Armageddon, the, the Islam, Islamic version of Armageddon, the end of the world, so that the true Muslims can be ascended into heaven and the rest of the infidels can go off to wherever you know, infidel hell is in, in, in that particular teaching. And we laugh about that, or we say, oh, that's pretty primitive. The thing is, we have Christians in our own government who are trying to do the same thing. Bring about Armageddon. Some people say that's why we have a close alliance with Israel. I'm not going to get into politics here. I'm just saying that that's something that people have said. 
but there are people who have professed that they're trying to bring about Armageddon, Christian Armageddon, to where the true believers and the Christians can be ascended into heaven, raptured up, and the rest of us can end up in the lake of fire. The people who go to churches like ours, right? <laughs> so this is the interplay that we see going on in the world. And so, fortunately, blessedly, there is a third archetype. It is called the mender. Menders are healers. There are those who come along and look at this and say, how can we create a healing here? How can we create something that works? How can we create a world that works for all? So the mythology of the healer, of, of the mender, is that there is a oneness. We are all one. They see the oneness in all of us. They live in a both-and universe rather than an either-or universe. If you're ever stuck in a decision, you're probably stuck in an either-or quandary. I can either have this or I can have that, but I can't see a way to have both. And the truth is, we live in a both-and universe, and if we'll step back from that and say, wait, time out, time out, I live in a both-and universe, there has got to be a way to have both-and, both this and this. And you will unstick yourself from where you're stuck in the decision. Okay? So they believe in a both-and universe. They are accepting. They are gentle and accepting of behaviors that are not approved of by others. And finally, love is the highest value or virtue that they, that they claim. Not self-greed or self-aggrandizement, you know, but love is the highest value. The role of the healer is to be the peacemakers. It's to find ways that incorporate the old and the new. It's to bring about a unification and it's to communicate with all sides. This is the role of the mender. Now, if you're sitting there going, gosh, this kind of sounds like us, we tend to be menders. Most of the people who attend religious science, new thought churches tend to be menders because we share that mythology. The positive of the mender is that they heal the pain or the clash between the keepers and the breakers, and they have a big holistic vision. See, they're creating a bright, shiny future too, but it's a bright, shiny future that includes everybody rather than just my bright, shiny future. The negative is they can get very discouraged because it takes time for all this to unfold. You know, in, in his book, um, Sharif Abdullah talks about the fact that the mending of this may take a whole millennium to happen. A whole millennium. We're going to be sowing seeds that we'll never see, that even our grandchildren won't see the results of. We'll see some of the direction heading, but it takes a while. Have you noticed? That as we try and bring the world around to a better, better and, and more loving place, that the, other, the, the people who want to keep the clash going go harder. There's kind of a pendulum swing. There's kind of a reaction to that. So we can get discouraged by that. We can get killed by the violence. Killed either physically or killed in soul by, by, being, by taking so many hits from people so many times. Verbal hits. Emotional hits. There's one more archetype I want to talk about that is not in the book, and that's what I call the withholder archetype. And a whole lot of people on our planet are engaged in that, that archetype. And it basically says, I'm not going to play. I'm not going to engage at all. I'm going to sit on the sidelines and wait and watch how things play out, and I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to put in my time, my energy, my money, my engagement, my thought, I'm just going to watch and not be involved. And a whole lot of people, you know, something like, like Paris happens, and people say, well, that's too bad. There's nothing I can do about that. How's the football game going? Okay? And that's going into withhold. The thing is with the withholder is it's a delusion because we all live and we all are playing on the field. And have you noticed that the game of life doesn't have any timeouts? Substitutions, <laughs> any of that stuff? You've, you've noticed this, right? Okay. So when we're busy standing on the sidelines, we're basically got our finger out blaming other people, giving them the power to do it, and we have no power of decision of our own. We are not engaged with the process, and we do not engage with the process, so we can't create our vision of a world that works for everyone, and we don't tap into that. So just take a breath. You just shake that out, shake that out. 
So I want to ask you a question. Here in this wonderful, beautiful center, where do you play? Where's your archetype? See, CSL is a wonderful place for us to practice and get better at the role we decide to play. I've always viewed spiritual centers like this as a laboratory, a place to play, a place to try out new things in a relatively loving environment, in a relatively supportive environment. People say, I wonder what it's like to sing. I've never really sang in a choir before, but I'd like to try. And so they come out and they try singing. And guess what? They find out they enjoy it. Or they find out they're really lousy at it, but they really like the music, so they do something else to help the choir. I don't sing with a choir. <laughs> it's a place to come and play. How can I be a leader? Maybe I'd like to try something new on. Maybe I'd like to lead an event. Maybe I'd like to try something else on. But how do I play in this environment? Or do I stand back and withhold? Do I hang on to the golden years? Am I here trying to make something new happen? And if I'm trying to make something new happen... Am I also trying to do it in a holistic way? See, most spiritual leaders, in fact, very, let me rephrase that. Every spiritual leader ever on this planet was a breaker. Everyone. Jesus said, I come not to bring peace, but to put a sword between father and son and mother and daughter. And what he's talking about is he's talking about the fact that I'm here to separate out those who are hanging on to the traditional ways from those who want to move forward. When the young man comes to him and says, what do I need to do to follow you? And he says, you need to let go of everything you have. Give it all away. Sell it to the poor. What he's saying is you need to let go of all the tradition, all the stuff that came behind you, and step into something fresh and new where you've never been before. Will you do that? Yes. And the young man's answer, of course, was no. <laughs> and that's where he comes up with this famous comment that it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel or a rope, depending on which translation you want to go through the eye of the needle. Okay? So we're constantly being called. We're constantly being called to this. Will we play? We can sit here and point fingers. And, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little raw here for a moment. I was thinking I was a little more raw in the first talk. But there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of undercurrent through parts of the congregation here. Okay? And I know some people have criticized me and don't like certain aspects of me. And I'm going to tell you this. If you want to find the perfect minister, good luck. You know, when I first came here, I had several minister friends said, you're taking that church? They've got issues. The first couple of them I listened to, and then after that I said, okay, so show me a church that doesn't. And that usually shut them up right there. Okay? Guess what? I have issues too. We all have issues together. And our dance is, can we work through the issues? Can we lift each other up? Can we love and grow each other as a village and as a support? Can we be menders for each other? If we can't do that here, how will we do it in Kuwait? How will we do it in Africa? How will we do it in ghettos throughout the United States? How will we do it anywhere else? This is a place where we get to play, where we get to practice, and where we get to experience and experiment. But what it takes is engagement. What it takes is engagement. See, Years ago, when I, I grew up in the CSL Seattle church, Reverend Kathy Ann Lewis, who's there, and <coughs> I hope she doesn't see this video, <coughs> is not an easy person to deal with. A few of you have met her. A few of you know her reputation but haven't met her. She's not an easy person to deal with. She's a fabulous spiritual teacher, powerful speaker, great organizer. Difficult person to get along with. Just ask her four previous husbands. <laughs> <laughs> but 
There was one day where I was running a sound system in the early 90s, mid-90s, and she was having a bad day, as she oftentimes did in those times. She was kind of, she'd come out of a divorce and was going through a, a real rough period in her life. And those of us who were the sound people usually got the brunt of what she was going through. So there was a particular morning where I took a particular hard hit in that regard. And during the 8.30 service, I decided that at the end of the service, I was going to take the soundboard and I was going to pull all the wiring out of the back, every one of the wires, and they were not labeled. I was going to take every dial and every knob and tweak it completely out of position and walk out. And they would have still had the two large services, the 9.45 and the 11 o'clock still to do. And it would have taken at least a week to rebuild that board. I was that angry. Fortunately, I started thinking <laughs> and listening. And what I realized was if I did that, I would never be able to set foot in that church again. And I would lose two things that were very valuable to me. Number one was access to this teaching. And number two was my community of friends that I had there. And I realized that both of those were more important than the personality of this particular person. I want to tell you something. This church isn't about me and whether you like me or whether you think I'm an easy-to-get-along-with personality or not. This church is about the teaching. This church is about the teaching that Ernest Holmes has brought forward. It's about, you know, Mary talked about it in her opening prayer. It's about the principles that we embody and embrace. These principles can heal the world and they can heal each of our individual lives and support us in having lives that are far greater than we've ever experienced. Some of you who have been around long enough know that. You've had those experiences. You've had shifts. I've had shifts because of these teachings. And so I invite you to get engaged with, to get, as I said earlier, jiggy with the teachings, the teaching itself. I don't care if you like me or don't like me. I will do my best to continue to grow as a person. You know, I've learned I don't throw rants on Facebook anymore. <laughs> okay? I learned that one. Okay? I learned several things. And I'm learning still more. And I'm doing my best to be an even better and deeper spiritual person and spiritual teacher. And so I will continue my growth. But what it takes also is for all of us to be engaged. See, I'm actually in a class right now. I'm taking Diana Johnson's Mastery of Self class. And I'm getting beautiful, wonderful, fabulous hits out of that class. Now, I've been in this movement and this teaching for 30 years. And I'm still getting it. I was teaching uh, foundations a week ago, and I got a major hit during the foundations class. It's probably the 50th time I've been through foundations. And what I found is that there's the, some of the people who have been around here for a while, a mentality that says, I've taken that class, tick it off, I'm done. My invitation is to come back to those classes again. Because they're deep. And you're not the same person you were when you first took them the first time. And you bring gifts of your own wisdom to the other students to share. Okay? My invitation is to get engaged. One of the things I'm going to do to make that easier is starting the first of the year, we're going to have, if you've taken a class before, it only costs 50% to, re to uh, renew it, to come back and review it. Okay? You know, Reverend Mary alluded to the fact that when she wasn't in the painting class, she stopped painting. And I, I, when, I was, when I was growing up, you know, when I was just a congregant in religious science, I was always in a class. Why? Because it kept me on. It kept me on. It's like, you know, going to a gym or doing exercise or something like that. You don't do it just once and say, well, I'm done with that. You know, I find that the classes keep me in my spiritual practice, keep me engaged with my spiritual side of myself and with the highest and greatest good. And then they keep my life opening up and opening up and opening up. So that's my invitation, is to become engaged with this teaching, with this center, to whatever level you feel comfortable. So, our spiritual practice this week is to take a look and ask myself, ask ourselves, what role have I been playing? What role have I been playing? And how is it working for me? What's my payoff for playing that role? What do I get as a benefit from it? And then secondly, the second part of this is, what role would I choose to play going forward? What role would I choose to play going forward? If I don't like that role, or maybe I like that role, but I want to tweak it a bit. Okay? What role do I want to play going forward? 
And if so, what are the qualities that I have to become in order to play that role? And what are the qualities that I have to release and let go of in order to play that role? It takes both of those. And then finally, to find an area to engage the role that I choose and do so. Find an area in this church, you know, or in your family, or in your work. Find an area somewhere to engage that role and to play it consciously. If I've always been a keeper, if, I'm, you know, if I really hang on to the old stuff, and we all have that within us, don't we? Yeah. There's a part of us that wants to stay. You know, I, I told the first service, I, I had, um, five years ago, I had cataract surgery. And they were going to replace my, my lenses my, in my eyes with, with 2020 lenses. I grew up with 2400 vision. And what that means is what you can see at 400 feet, I had to get within 20 feet to actually be able to see it or read it. Okay? Get it? Pretty dang blind, right? Coke bottle bottom glasses since I was in second grade. Okay? But one of the things that I realized, I started grieving right before the, the surgery was going to happen, was that I had this particular thing that I liked to do, which was late at night, before I would go to bed, I would take off my glasses, I would turn on a little space music, you know, have a glass of wine, and zone out. And it was what I called fuzz out, because everything got fuzzy in my vision. You know, when I was a Zen Buddhist and they said, have a soft focus, all I had to do was take my glasses off and there I was, you know? It was easy. Okay? And I realized that I was grieving the fact that I would never be able to do that again once I had new lenses in. Now, as a friend of mine later said, you know, you could have had a couple more glasses of wine and you would have been fuzzy. <coughs> you could take your reading glasses and smear Vaseline on them and you'd be fuzzy. You know, there's other solutions. And the truth is that once I, I had the, the surgery, and the first time I went and drove and I could see a mile down the road with absolute clarity, it's like, woohoo, you know, I love this new, new way of being. But I had this grieving process to let go before I could do the process. So do we, do we hang on to stuff a little bit too much? Are we breakers a little bit too much? Is, is there maybe not quite the honoring of what went before, or perhaps not the seeing of the holistic vision and being willing to embody all that? Can I maybe expand that? Or can I be a mender? Can I be a mender who helps to heal the world? So I invite you to play with one of those roles consciously this week and just see what it's like. Are you willing to do that? Yes. Great. Me too. So I want to close with a quote from Sharif Abdullah, the author of, of the book, The World That Works For All. All beings, all things are one. Our lives are inextricably linked one to another. Because of this, we cannot wage war against anything or anyone without waging war against ourselves. Therefore, we are obliged to treat all beings the way we want to be treated. There are no enemies. All beings are expressions of the sacred and must be treated as such. Some beings cause pain to others. This does not mean that they are enemies. Some beings are food for others. This is all the more reason to treat them as sacred. Once we understand that we are interconnected, we have the responsibility to create a world that works for all. So I want to invite you this week to play with that. To avoid the temptation that the media likes to spin us up into and, and other things. Have enemies have this and that, and to create a world that works for all. Let's move into prayer. So I recognize that there is one infinite presence, one pure, intense love, greater than everything else. That infinite presence that every spiritual teacher, every mystic who's ever touched tells us is a love beyond all things. A love greater than everything. Nothing is excluded from that love. And so I recognize that as this is so, each of us is one of this infinite presence, one of this divine one. We are that love embodied in form. And our only purpose for being here is to allow that love to flow through us into the specific human ways into the specific human level of which we are engaged. Emerson reminds us that we are inlets. We're already inlets into the divine. 
We are inlets to the divine and may become outlets to the degree that we are willing to express that divine quality of love. And so I speak my word that we are the lovers and the menders of this world. So we are not afraid of either keeping or breaking because we can see past both of those and see a larger paradigm that includes and is greater than both of those. We hold this whole process in including ourselves in deep, deep love. We refuse to take on enemies. We refuse to blame. We simply recognize our oneness with all. We simply recognize the pain of people who do not yet understand what we understand and do our best to create a greater world so that they can experience that also. A friend of mine likes to say, we look at the news and use it as a prayer request. And so for each person who says yes to this, for each person engaged in this process of creating a world that works for all, of creating a world that is greater in love than anything else, I'm ever so grateful. The spirit that moves in through and as all of us and guides us perfectly as we awaken to this possibility, I am ever so grateful. And so we release this word. I release this word into a law that moves it because it knows how. We don't have to figure out the how. We simply decide the what. And the law moves this word into form and expression here in this human world with perfect ease, with perfect grace, with perfect divine right action. And so it does. And together we say, and so it is. Thank you.